This video is made possible by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Watch another brand new full length companion video to this one in my ongoing Modern Conflict series that explains the entire course of Russia's military interventions abroad in Syria, along with 13 other episodes with nearly five hours of combined content covering major recent international conflicts like the Russian war against Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Georgia, and the Chechen wars of the 1990s. All of which you can access by signing up for the Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle deal for less than $15 a year at curiositystream.com slash real life lore. Over his entire 22 year long career as the leader of Russia, Vladimir Putin's primary objectives have been to overturn the end result of the Cold War by restoring Russia's position as a global great power, re establish the Kremlin's domination across the shattered pieces of the former Soviet Union, and push back against the growing influence of the United States and NATO. He has used many tools to accomplish these objectives, but none have been greater than Russia's unique and highly valued geology. Across the vastness of Russia's land stretching from the Baltic Sea in the west to the Pacific Ocean in the east, Moscow possesses and produces enormous quantities of natural gas and oil. So much so that Russia is currently the world's single largest exporter of gas and the second largest exporter of oil, remaining only behind Saudi Arabia. Russia is an energy superpower, and it is the sale of these energy resources abroad that are the literal foundation of the modern Russian state and all of Putin's objectives, including the ongoing war in Ukraine, as they provide as much as 40 to 50 percent of the Russian government's budget and as much as 30 percent of the Russian GDP. This is precisely why the late U.S. Senator John McCain once derided Russia as being nothing more than a gas station masquerading as a country, and the gas station sells most of their stuff to Europe. Half of Russia's oil exports and nearly three-fourths of their natural gas exports all flow westwards towards Europe. This ultimately means that Russia supplies roughly 35% of the European Union's natural gas and 25% of their oil, when considering that oil accounts for 36% of Europe's total consumption of energy and natural gas a further 25%. That roughly means that Europe relies on Russian oil and gas for nearly one-fifth of their entire energy needs, while Russia relies on European cash for nearly one-third of their entire government budget. And this is simultaneously Russia's greatest strength and Russia's greatest weakness. Every single aggressive action that Putin's Russia has taken recently from the current invasion of Ukraine to the annexation of Crimea more than eight years years ago, to the invasion of Georgia 14 years ago, to the conquest of Chechnya more than 20 years ago, is defined by the ever-evolving geopolitical calculus of this strength and weakness. And more than anything else, the geology of Russia and the former Soviet Union is the most imperative thing to understand about Vladimir Putin's thought processes and strategy and the emerging 21st century Cold War between his Russia and the United States. When the Soviet Union suddenly collapsed just over three decades ago, the former empire that had existed in one way or another across one-sixth of the Earth's total landmass splintered into 15 newly independent countries, ranging from tiny ones like Armenia and Estonia to giants like Kazakhstan, roughly the same area as India. But the entity that remains centered in Moscow, the Russian Federation, the Soviet Union's legal successor state, loomed the largest of them all, towering over the newly independent states like a titan. Nearly overnight when compared to the former Soviet Union, the new Moscow-based regime, in the form of the Russian Federation, had lost nearly half of its entire population, with tens of millions of ethnic Russians suddenly finding themselves outside the borders of Russia. The area directly ruled from Moscow shrunk in size by a fourth, taking 40% of the Soviet-era GDP and industrial capacity along with it. The massive Soviet nuclear weapons arsenal suddenly became divided, with around 1,900 warheads stuck in Ukraine, unable to be utilized by them because the launch codes remained in the hands of the Kremlin back in Moscow. In theory, this temporarily made Ukraine the world's third largest nuclear power, 
but they voluntarily gave them all up to Russia in exchange for assurances from them, the United States, and United Kingdom that the existing borders of Ukraine, as they were at the time, would be respected. All of this was pretty bad from the perspective of Moscow, but perhaps the worst thing to come from the dissolution of the Soviet Union for them wasn't necessarily the fracturing of the empire's land, population, or nuclear arsenal, but the fracturing of its geological resources. Specifically, the fracturing of the Soviet Union's once enormous oil and gas industry, which had been the largest in the world. Prior to the collapse, Moscow controlled some of the largest oil and gas reserves found anywhere on the planet. Across the Caucasus, Caspian Sea, Central Asia, the Volga Urals, West Siberia, and far east regions of their huge empire. Shipping these resources out by ship to customers around the world was potentially problematic though, because of one of Russia's other great and tragic historical weaknesses, the lack of easy access to the world's oceans. The Soviet Union only controlled a handful of warm water ports that remained ice-free and easily usable year-round, in the Barents, Baltic, Black, and Japan seas all of which could be easily blockaded by their primary Cold War era geopolitical rivals in NATO and the United States through the GIUK Gap, the Strait of Dover, the Danish Straits, the Turkish Straits, and the Japanese Archipelago. In the event of a war with the West, the Soviet Navy and maritime trade could be very easily bottled in and contained. And so, Soviet military doctrine always focused on being much more of a land power as a result. And this geographically inspired doctrine flowed into the state's economic planning as well. Knowing full well these geographic limitations to trading their oil and gas on the high seas, the Soviets built a massive series of pipelines over their vast expanses of land, connecting the energy-hungry European economies in the West directly to their huge geological formations around the Caspian, Volga Urals, and West Siberian regions in the East. With sparse domestic oil and gas resources themselves, this made the most logical geographic and economic sense for the nations of Europe. The most substantial resources of oil and gas around their continent discovered so far are located within the Groningen field of the Netherlands, the North Sea between the UK and Norway, the various regions of the former Soviet Union, including Ukraine, the Black Sea, the Persian Gulf, the Eastern Mediterranean, and North Africa. By a freak geological coincidence, the territory that would eventually evolve into the European Union itself has very little hydrocarbon resources. And since the Soviet Union was located nearby on the same continent, and had built out the efficient pipelines feeding cheaper oil and gas directly from their massive sources in the east, they were the most logical geographic partner on the docket to choose to buy from, regardless of the potential geopolitical consequences and pressures that could come from Moscow and the Kremlin. Thus, the Soviet Union became the world's largest oil and gas producer. And as the price of oil skyrocketed throughout the 1970s, the revenues that Moscow was gaining from selling them were enormous enough to effectively fund almost everything the country was doing, including the massive Soviet arms race with the United States and the newfound confidence in the Kremlin to pursue risky foreign policy decisions like the invasion of Afghanistan in 1980. But oil and gas are cyclical assets, and an economy that is too over-reliant on them can only have a party for so long. When oil prices collapsed later in 1986, Moscow's primary economic strength evaporated with it. The inefficient, centrally planned Soviet economy could no longer conceal all of its shortcomings with high oil and gas sales, and Moscow's finances became crippled. This was potentially the biggest single factor pushing the Soviet Union towards its ultimate collapse in the late 80s. And once it finally did in 1991, the once united oil and gas industry of the country fell apart alongside it. A significant amount of the oil and gas reserves around the Caspian Sea basin were suddenly in the newly independent nations of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan. The huge, interconnected Soviet-era pipeline infrastructure connecting their massive hydrocarbon fields in Siberia to Europe now had thousands of miles worth of pipes flowing through the newly independent Ukraine. 
who is now suddenly legally entitled to demand transit fees on oil and gas headed to Europe from Moscow. And with a sudden collapse of communism, the formerly centralized and state-owned oil and gas enterprises remaining within Russia experienced the massive shock of near spontaneous privatization. The oil and gas industry was the most significant source of Soviet power, and now it was divided and in chaos. The new Russia was no longer a superpower, and was no longer even really an energy superpower. And almost immediately, Western energy companies were diving in on the Soviet Union's splintered carcass, attempting to gather up their assets. Long before Ukraine took the center stage of the world's attention in the post-Soviet arena, Moscow's and the West's focus were each firmly centered upon the area around the Caspian Sea. The collapse of the Soviet Union and the independence of the states around the Caspian roughly coincided with the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait and the Gulf War, where Saddam Hussein nearly managed to grab control over half of the world's known supply of oil around the Persian Gulf. That war stoked massive fears in Washington and Europe over their over-reliance on Middle Eastern oil coming from around the turbulent Persian Gulf, and led the West to begin searching for alternative sources to diversify their supplies, like from around the freshly independent post-Soviet states around the oil and gas rich Caspian. For you see, the Caspian is the world's largest inland body of water, and the basin that surrounds it contains an estimated 48 billion barrels of oil and 292 trillion cubic feet worth of natural gas. In other words, the Caspian Basin is home to roughly 3% of the world's proven reserves of oil and 4% of its proven reserves of natural gas, which is significant. And most of these significant reserves were all located inside just four of the newly independent states around the sea. When combined, all four of them controlled more than 16,700 cubic kilometers worth of proven natural gas reserves more than Saudi Arabia, and more than one-third of the gas reserves remaining throughout the rest of the new Russian Federation. As the Soviet Union's legal successor state, and with the lion's share of the former Soviet Union's oil and gas reserves still remaining in the Urals and Siberia, the Russian Federation naturally inherited the lucrative and almost monopolistic Soviet oil and gas trade with the European market. It was within Moscow's best interests to maintain as high of a market share in Europe as possible by preventing as many outsiders they could from independently entering it, especially the brand new hydrocarbon-rich states of the former Soviet Union that they no longer had outright control over. Luckily for them, the Caspian is located very far inland and very far away from any major bodies of water that connect it to the oceans. And so, exporting the hydrocarbon reserves found around it requires extremely expensive land-based infrastructure like pipelines or rails to move them towards export markets like the West. As a result, all of the region's oil and gas exports to the West had previously relied on the integrated Soviet-era pipeline and rail network that routed through Russia towards the Black Sea and Europe which continued to give Moscow a high degree of influence and control over the Caspian state's oil and gas-based economies, despite their official independence. And so, with an understandable desire within the new Caspian states for newfound economic independence, through export routes that went around Russia, and with the West's own desire for Caspian hydrocarbon supplies, and Russia's desire to prevent them, a decade of fierce geopolitical competition throughout Central Asia and the Caucasus ensued between them. Kazakhstan ended up enlisting a consortium of oil companies to build out the Caspian Pipeline, connecting their major oil fields through southern Russia to the Black Sea port of Novorossiysk, where the oil is then loaded up on a tankers and transported through the Turkish Straits to the global market. But, crucially, Russian oil and gas companies like Transneft, Rosneft, and Luke Oil own 44% of the shares in this pipeline, and it terminates at a Russian-controlled port. And it is Kazakhstan's most essential lifeline to getting their critical oil and gas resources to the worldwide market. 
Moscow therefore still controls significant parts of Kazakhstan's ability to export oil and gas to Europe. And Kazakhstan is even further a member of Russia's own defense and trade unions, like the Collective Security Treaty Organization and the Eurasian Economic Union. Kazakhstan has therefore never really been a threat to Moscow's market in Europe, nor her objectives of controlling or influencing the former Soviet world. And if they ever became a threat in the future, there is the implicit threat that since 25% of the population of Kazakhstan are ethnic Russians or Ukrainians in the north, Moscow already has a ready-to-go pretext for invasion to liberate them. But Azerbaijan turned into a completely different story. Much to the opposition of Moscow, they ended up enlisting the help of a consortium made up almost entirely of Western energy companies, led by British Petroleum to help construct their pipeline connection to the world market. But Azerbaijan's geography made the route that would be selected difficult to choose. Routing the pipeline through Russia would have undermined the entire point of securing a viable export route that was independent from their influence. The United States heavily pressured against routing the pipeline to the south through Iran, and Azerbaijan's own ongoing military conflict with Armenia in the west over the status of Nagorno-Karabakh eliminated the pipeline from traveling west. That only left Georgia a mountainous and politically unstable post-Soviet state with two major separatist areas to route the pipeline through. But with no other choice, the consortium chose Georgia anyway, and by 2005, the Baku-Tbilisi-Sehan, or BTC pipeline, had finally been finished. The second largest pipeline anywhere in the former Soviet Union that finally connected Azerbaijan's enormous oil and gas reserves around the Caspian to the Turkish port of Sehan on the Mediterranean Sea, and ultimately from there by tanker ship to Europe, and all completely independent of any Russian influence. Since the pipeline went through Georgia and reduced Western dependence on Middle Eastern oil, the pipeline would later become a major factor in the American support for Georgia in joining NATO in the early 2000s, which would eventually culminate with an invasion from Russia in 2008 and the occupation of their breakaway territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. As a result, Georgia has never been allowed into NATO ever since, and the Georgian government maintains no diplomatic relations with Moscow. $45 billion would later be invested by the West in a series of additional natural gas pipelines dubbed the Southern Gas Corridor across Turkey, Greece, Albania, the Adriatic Sea, and directly into Italy that would further connect Azerbaijani gas directly to customers in Europe, specifically designed to further reduce European reliance on Russian gas. This system finally became operational on the final day of 2020, and now because of it, Azerbaijan expects to be able to supply the EU with about 10.5 billion cubic meters of gas by the end of this year, which by 2019 levels is a little more than 2% of the EU's total gas consumption. It may not be a huge amount, but it certainly eats into Russia's overall market share. And even more importantly, the cash that Azerbaijan earns from these sales is enough to finance around 60% of their entire government budget, cementing their own financial and political independence from Moscow for good. That pipeline to the West truly made Azerbaijan a real, independent nation. And one of the biggest fears in the Kremlin is that the Caspian Sea's oil and gas resources, formerly all beneath centralized Soviet control, could lead to even more regional defections from Moscow and further chip away at their market share in Europe. For decades, Turkmenistan, the country that today has the sixth largest proven reserves of natural gas in the world, has floated around the idea of the Trans-Caspian Pipeline with Western energy companies, if ever realized. This pipeline would stretch from the country's enormous gas fields in the east and move westwards beneath the Caspian Sea and link up with Azerbaijan's already existing pipeline infrastructure towards Europe. It's projected that, if ever built, it would be capable of transporting some 30 billion 
pushing more cubic meters of natural gas towards the European Union, or nearly 7% of their entire consumption. Obviously, this would almost certainly cut into Russia's own shares of gas supplies to the continent, and their bottom line to the tune of billions of dollars. And so, they've been continuously opposed to it for decades. Moscow insists that any pipeline beneath the Caspian Sea would be unacceptable for environmental reasons, and they've taken the legal position that any potential pipeline project across or beneath the Caspian must be approved by all five of the states that share a coastline there, including themselves, which they'll just never give. And so, the project currently still remains only an idea. And Turkmenistan continues instead to pipe more than half of their gas to the east towards China, a market that isn't yet as lucrative to Moscow and not yet an existential threat. Vladimir Putin came to power as the president of Russia in May of 2000 just over eight years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and he certainly understood, even back then, the immense power that oil and gas could give the Russian state. Although allegedly highly plagiarized, he wrote his doctoral thesis at the St. Petersburg Mining University in 1997. And after assuming the presidency, Putin began running the Russian Federation much like the CEO of an energy company would. Thus, it's far more helpful to think of modern Russia as more of an energy company that happens to also control a huge state armed with nuclear weapons. He led the state-owned oil company, Rosneft, to produce 40% of Russia's total oil while controlling more than half of the company's shares. Similarly, the Russian state also controls more than half of the shares in Gazprom, the largest company in Russia that produces more than 12% of the entire world's natural gas supply. The CEOs of both companies are longtime friends of Putin dating back to the 1990s, before he assumed the presidency. And unlike his immediate predecessors of the 1990s, Putin was incredibly fortunate because the international prices of oil and gas began to skyrocket shortly after he assumed office, and Russian financial power was once again on the upswing alongside it. Between 2000, when Putin first took office, and 2012, the value of Russia's annual oil and gas exports increased by around sevenfold, from only $53 billion in 2000 to $351 billion in 2012. Consequently, Putin used these funds to dramatically increase the annual budget of the Russian military by nearly ninefold, from just $9.2 billion to $81.4 billion over that same time period. In addition to paying off the Soviet Union Union's entire outstanding debt and freeing up his ambitions across the rest of the post-Soviet world. Outside of Central Asia, one of the biggest problems for Putin's goals were the old Soviet-era pipeline networks that took Russia's hydrocarbon resources to market in Europe, the Brotherhood network through Ukraine, and the Northern Lights network through Belarus. Belarus remained an effective puppet state of the Kremlin, and so the Northern Lights network wasn't very troubling. But Ukraine was very different. As as late as 2005, 80% of Russia's oil and gas exports to Europe were still all concentrated through the Brotherhood network across Ukraine, because that network simply had the highest capacity at the time. None of this mattered when Ukraine and Russia were all part of the same country, but now that they weren't, it mattered a ton. And it began mattering even more after 2005, following Ukraine's Orange Revolution and the rise to power of the pro-Western Viktor Yushchenko as president. Russia demanded that Ukraine transfer the ownership over the entire Brotherhood pipeline network to them, which was staunchly refused by Yushchenko's new pro-Western government. At the same time, Ukraine still relied on Russian natural gas imports for most of their own consumption as well. And twice during the winters of 2006 and 2009, Russia strategically penalized Ukraine and applied political pressure by temporarily cutting off their gas supplies exactly when they needed them the most. And in both instances, Moscow accused the Ukrainians of siphoning off gas traveling through the pipes that was intended for Europe. 
In the eyes of Moscow, Ukraine was becoming an unreliable bridge for their pipelines to Europe, and alternative routes began to be constructed, like Yamal through Belarus and Poland, Turk Stream and Blue Stream beneath the Black Sea directly to Turkey, and most controversially of all, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 at the cost of 10 and 11 billion dollars each respectively, beneath the Baltic Sea feeding directly to Germany. Russia's single largest oil and gas customer, and Germany was only increasing their dependence. In 2011, after a tsunami struck the Fukushima nuclear power plant in Japan and sparked the world's biggest nuclear disaster since Chernobyl, the German government took the decision to gradually phase out all 17 of their own nuclear reactors that, in 2011, produced a quarter of Germany's entire electricity. The final three were theoretically scheduled to come offline at the end of 2022. And to make up the difference, Germany began importing even more gas from Russia, increasing the value of Moscow's leverage over them. By 2010, the Ukrainian president was no longer the pro-Western Viktor Yushchenko, but the pro-Russian Viktor Yanukovych. And this was important, because huge discoveries were just being made at the time by various energy companies that suddenly showed Ukraine had proven natural gas reserves of 1.1 trillion cubic meters, and they could potentially be as high as 5.4 trillion cubic meters. Largely focused in rich geological deposits around offshore Crimea, the Sea of Azov, the Western Carpathians, and the Dnieper Donetsk Rift in the Northeast, where more than 80% of those 1.1 trillion cubic meters worth of proven reserves were located. These discoveries in the early 2010s suddenly revealed that Ukraine held the second largest known proven reserves of natural gas in Europe, only behind Norway's 1.53 trillion cubic meters. Through a long series of gas pipelines stretching across the North Sea to Europe, Norway has used those reserves to become the second largest exporter of gas to Europe only after Russia, and provides roughly 19% of the EU's total supply. So, Ukraine, with potentially as much as three and a half times more natural gas than Norway, and with one of the world's largest pipeline networks from the Soviet era already built out across the country directly towards Europe, could have easily all of a sudden become an enormous provider of natural gas to Europe and cut tens if not hundreds of billions of dollars into Russia's biggest market. Moreover, Ukraine's gas infrastructure also includes storage sites capable of holding more than 31 billion cubic meters worth of gas, and they have been severely underutilized for decades. The entire European Union can currently only store 100 billion cubic meters, and thus, if Ukraine were to ever join the EU, they would increase their gas storage capabilities by a third, and thus severely reduce the ability of Moscow to pressure European governments during the winter, precisely when they need their gas the most. The only problems for Ukraine at the time were that they didn't have the technology or the equipment to really go after any of these reserves, and their president at the time was closely aligned with the Kremlin, so the fear in Moscow was not yet on high alert. But those problems were being rapidly solved. In September of 2011, the Ukrainian government signed a deal with ExxonMobil to explore shale gas reserves across the country. In January 2013, they signed another deal worth $10 billion with Shell to explore the Yuzivska gas field in the Donbass. And later on that same year, in November, they signed another $10 billion deal with Chevron to explore the fields in the far west near the Carpathians. Western energy companies were rapidly moving in to unlock Ukraine's natural gas potential, just as they had around the Caspian Sea a decade previously. And then, all of a sudden, early on in February of the next year in 2014, Ukraine itself underwent an enormous pro-Western political revolution. The pro-Russian Ukrainian president at the time, set to sign an association agreement with the European Union, suddenly declined at the last moment, paid for by a last-minute offer from Putin for 30% cheaper gas prices to his country and a $15 billion aid package. Kiev erupted in revolution. Yanukovych's regime was toppled as he fled to Russia, and a new, very pro-Western regime rose to power in the country. Suddenly, Ukraine almost overnight transformed into the single biggest existential threat to Russia's gas monopoly in Europe. And Putin 
the energy CEO of Russia, would never tolerate that threat. Backed up by the high prices of oil and gas at the time, Putin ordered the first invasion of Ukraine. Russian troops showed up in Crimea and annexed the peninsula into Russia, taking with it a significant amount of Ukraine's EEZ and potential offshore gas reserves. And at the same time, Russian soldiers began intervening on the side of pro-Russian separatists in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine, a large amount of which exists directly on the Dnieper-Donetsk rift with the Yuzivska field that Shell had just signed a $10 billion deal for the year before. Putin may have justified these attacks on Ukraine as the so-called liberation of Crimea and the Donbass area's Russian-speaking minorities, but it also didn't hurt that the attacks eliminated access to a lot of Ukraine's potential and real gas reserves in the process. By the end of the year, Exxon, Shell, and Chevron had all abandoned their projects in Ukraine, citing the new risky political environment and Russia had effectively kneecapped its greatest threat to the domination of the European gas market. But although this objective was technically successful, Russia's finances still suffered greatly. The price of oil and gas began to collapse just a few months after the invasion, and Western sanctions began targeting specific Russian oil and gas projects that required Western technology to access, like the Bajanov Formation in Siberia and Sakhalin in the Arctic. But over the years since 2014, Russia has retained its stranglehold over the European oil and gas market, and their government budget has not been harmed too severely as a result. After the COVID-19 financial crash in March and April of 2020, the price of oil plummeted so low that it reached negative $37.62 a barrel. But ever since then, oil and gas prices have been continuously climbing back to their highest level seen in a decade and the price of oil finally recovered to its 2014-era levels by February of 2022, the very same month that Vladimir Putin decided to launch his full-scale invasion across Ukraine. Moscow always, always takes riskier foreign policy decisions when oil and gas prices are high, dating back to Crimea, Georgia, and even Afghanistan in the Soviet era. So this shouldn't have really come as much of a surprise. And now, more than three months into the invasion and the war, Putin's war aims are quite clear. He is attempting to conquer and occupy the Donbass region and Kharkiv, along with Ukraine's entire coastline on the Black Sea, transforming what remains of Ukraine into a landlocked state. If he is successful, Ukraine will be financially crippled, with the loss of all of her ports and ability to export resources by sea, the loss of nearly all of her proven reserves of natural gas, and the loss of nearly all of her coal, which is also mostly located in the Donbass. This is a war over resources, Russia's desire to maintain their monopoly in Europe at all costs, and Putin's own decades-long obsession to reassert Russia's influence over the former Soviet Union and return Russia to the status of a major world power. Putin has argued that Russians and Ukrainians are the same people, but by invading Ukraine, he has severely miscalculated and he is almost certain to fail all of these big overarching objectives. Putin may conquer Ukrainian land and cripple Ukraine's ability to ever be an economic threat to his regime, but he's also committed the single greatest act in history of missing the forest for the trees. Because oil and gas, especially Russian oil and gas, does not have very much time left in this world. Even before the invasion, the European Union had targets of becoming a completely carbon-neutral economy by 2050, less than 28 years from now, which already established a 28-year expiration date on Russia's largest source of government revenues. Perhaps Putin considered this before attacking, that he may as well have invaded now when he had the energy strength, rather than later when he wouldn't. But now that he has, Europe is likely to push up their alternative energy resources at a much faster pace, both for the climate and now for energy security. France is building new nuclear reactors. Germany is debating keeping theirs online for longer. The United States is dramatically stepping up liquefied natural gas or LNG exports to the continent. The Baltic states have already ended all of their Russian oil and gas imports. The EU expects to fully ban Russian oil imports by the end of the year. Germany has cancelled the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that would have doubled their gas imports from Russia, and they're planning on eventually removing Russia's gas imports entirely within a few years. 
Russia's power is oil and gas. But oil and gas are going to grow less and less important throughout this century. And their primary market in Europe that provides one-third of their entire government budget is quickly drying up. Russia needs Europe more than Europe needs Russia. The Russians may be able to pivot with new pipelines and LNG exports of their own to China, Turkey, India, and the poorer countries of the former Soviet Union, but it's unlikely that they'll be able to make up the difference there with Europe, because they simply aren't as geographically nearby to Russia's huge geologic sources, and so they will simply not be as economically competitive. Russia doesn't have any pipelines connecting to China yet from their massive gas fields in western Siberia, the same ones that are currently supplying Europe. Building out new pipelines to China from those sources will be costly, time-consuming, and ultimately, China will be the one in the better economic position to demand cheaper, discounted gas from a Russia that can't sell anything to Europe. And thus, Oil and gas may be Russia's greatest strength, but it's also Russia's greatest liability. And if Moscow proves unable to properly pivot from the disaster of this war, that weakness will almost certainly cripple them for the rest of the 21st century. Everything that Putin's Russia does revolves around the geology of the former Soviet Union. Just take a look at this graph, which charts oil and gas prices since 1946, and consider the major events of modern Russian history. In the 60s and early 70s, the Soviet Union was stagnating. In the early 1970s, the Soviet Union exploded in power and confidence and invaded Afghanistan in 1980. 1989, the Soviets pulled out from Afghanistan and, in 1991, the country collapsed. Throughout the 90s, Russia was stagnant. In 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. In 2014, Russia invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea. During the second half of the 2010s and early 20s, Russia launched military interventions abroad in Syria and the Central African Republic. And finally here, Russia invaded Ukraine. The relationship between Russia's geology and geography on one side, and her ability and willingness to wage wars and initiate conflicts on the other are directly related. But unfortunately, if I made videos covering the wars and conflicts side of that equation on YouTube, their inherently violent and controversial nature and details would mean that they would become demonetized and age-restricted, and as a result, YouTube's algorithm wouldn't promote them to you, and there's simply no way that you would ever see any of them here. That's why instead, I created yet another full-length companion video to this one in my ongoing Modern Conflict series that's about the same length as this video that covers the entire course and explanation behind Russia's military interventions abroad in the Syrian Civil War and uploaded it directly to Nebula, which, as you've probably heard by now, is home to tons of exclusive, ad-free content like my entire higher modern conflict series, with 13 other full-length videos with nearly 5 hours worth of additional content that you can go and watch right now, including these videos covering the events of Russia's war against Ukraine leading up to the events we've seen in 2022, the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008, the Russian invasions of Chechnya in the 1990s, and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan back in the 1980s. Of course, the reason why all of these videos are only available on Nebula is because because they just wouldn't ever work on YouTube and would never be viewed here because of the way that this site works. On the other hand, Nebula is a different platform, without an algorithm and without any ads. It's just a platform about great and unique content made by great and independent educational creators, with plenty of other unique, exclusive bonus projects from other creators you probably already know, like Real Engineering's Incredible Battle of Britain series, multiple hour-long plus documentaries from Wendover Productions, and Half as Interesting's hilarious game shows. The best way to get access to Nebula and all of this incredible content is definitely through the amazing Curiosity Stream and Nebula bundle deal. And with its current sales price, it's less than $15 a year to get full access to both sites. And Curiosity Stream has some phenomenal stuff that you'll definitely enjoy as well, like Afghanistan 1979, an hour-long documentary focusing on the entire Soviet invasion of Afghanistan from beginning to end with modern interviews from historical figures of the time, like Mikhail Gorbachev and the wife of Iran's final Shah. If you want to see a documentary explaining in depth the historical trend of Russian leadership making poor foreign policy invasion decisions, then this is the documentary for you to go and watch right now. 
I really can't recommend it enough, and I genuinely don't know about a better deal that exists anywhere in streaming. You get two streaming sites, both with content you'll actually watch, and all for less than $15 a year at the current sales price. But what's more, signing up will actually help countless independent educational creators beyond just real life lore. So please make sure to do so by clicking this button that's here on screen right now, which will take you directly to curiositystream.com slash real life lore to sign up or by following the link that's down below in the description. And as always, thank you so much for watching.